three hours on the cross, one an eternity, an eternity. That's amazing. While sports fishing off the Florida coast, a tourist capsized his boat. That he could swim, but he was afraid of alligators, and that kept him clinging to the overturned craft. And he spotted an old, an old beachcomber standing on the shore, and he shouted to him, are there any gators around here? Nah, the man hollered back, ain't been around for years. So feeling safe, he started swimming leisurely towards the shore. About halfway there, he asked again, he said to the guy, how'd you get rid of the gators? And the guy says, we didn't do nothing. The sharks got them. <laughs> True story, I suppose. <laughs> no, not really. Acts 28, or 26, 18 says, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Would you bow your heads, dear Lord, this morning as we have the opportunity to handle your word and to bring it to the family in the house here, Lord, today, we pray that you will accompany this word and that you will guide it and direct it to where you want it to go and it will accomplish what you want it to accomplish. Bless all of your people today in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of the sermon is Two Kingdoms. We're talking about a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness. Two kingdoms. From darkness to light from Satan to God. Everyone's in darkness until they come to Christ in faith. Repent of their ways and live for God. That's where we are. We're in the light because we have done that. Yes. We've asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior. This applies what, what he did on the cross to our particular soul. This darkness is ascribed to Satan. Darkness is an obscuring factor in life. When light goes out, or when, let's say when night falls, when the light goes out, or when the light falls, the path or the way is obscured. Moving about is restricted. When you can't see where you're going, it's best to stay where you are, to stand still. Otherwise, stumbling around in the dark can cause injury. Satan's goal is to get between the light and you. In a spiritual sense, the light is the word of God. Darkness is Satan's realm. He does his best to keep the gospel light away from sinners. He also tries to keep the light of the gospel away from believers. We have to stay in the word. The light is ascribed to God. The conflict between the kingdom of light, God's kingdom, and the kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, is the age-old eternal struggle. The world was plunged into the darkness of sin when Adam and Eve accepted sin from Satan. Everything changed. God's perfection became contaminated. We don't know how long Adam and Eve walked in the garden in, in the perfection of holiness we get the impression that wasn't very long, but we don't know that. You know, uh, maybe a hundred years before they fell. I don't know. Maybe one year. Maybe one week. We don't know how long it was until that happened. But it did. 
We don't know how many times Satan may have tempted them in one way or another before he succeeded. The kingdom of light was contaminated by the darkness of sin. Satan is described as the god of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Beginning with verse 3, it says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So God is the creator of light. His kingdom is the kingdom of light. Satan is the interferer of the light. He obscures God's light. Satan's kingdom is the kingdom of darkness. Genesis 1, 1 to 5, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. So God created the light. The light was good. Darkness is not good. The light that God created in Genesis chapter 1 is the physical light, the light that we see. The darkness is the interference of the light. There is physical light and spiritual light. The reason you have darkness is at night is because the world turns away from the sun. The source of light. The sun is still there. You're in the dark because you're in the shadow of the earth. If you go into a dark building and it's sunny outside, the sun is still there, but it's obscured by the structure that you have entered. An interesting, and I don't know why I'm bringing this up, I didn't plan to. An interesting thing in the, in the history of photography they had what they called camera obscura. And this was, somebody noticed if you went into a, a shed and it was light outside and there was a, a very small hole in the door of that shed, opposite that was a, would be a picture of whatever was, whatever was outside. A little pinhole acts as a lens and there's a picture there and that was called camera obscura I don't know why I told you that it was just part of the history of I was a professional photographer for 45 years but that, then they made pinhole cameras you could put I've done this you could put sensitized material and a pinhole and you can make a picture that way without a lens anyway Jesus is the light First chapter of John, verse 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word is light. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible, God's word is the illumination that I need to guide me on the path of life. That's not redundant, a lamp for my feet and a light for my path, because the light for my feet 
shows me where I happen to be. And the light from my path shows me where I'm going. Interestingly, that verse doesn't have a provision for where I've been. Because once I get into the light, once I get into holiness and into the light, it doesn't matter where I've been. It matters where I'm going. I threw that in extra, no charge. God has a kingdom, the kingdom of light. In John chapter 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When we get saved, we emerge from the kingdom of darkness and we come into the glorious light of God's kingdom. I'm talking about spiritual light, not the light that you can turn on and off, not the sun. Something happens. The veil is taken away. The holy truth of the gospel comes in. God's light penetrates the darkness in which we were once living and the miracle of salvation happens to us. We enter into God's kingdom. There's two kings and we come from one and go into the other one. The greatest miracle, the greatest healing that can happen is the miracle of salvation. It's a miracle when you come out of the darkness and into the light. John 12, 46, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Colossians 1, through 1, 13 to 14. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Satan has a kingdom. That's the kingdom of darkness. Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In the King James, the same verse, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The following that I'm reading is from a site called Renner Ministries, where they say in Ephesians 6, 12, the apostle Paul presents a divine revelation he received that describes how Satan's kingdom has been militarily aligned. He writes, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, I'm repeating now, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Note that the top of this list, Paul mentions the group of evil spirits he calls principalities. This word is taken from the Greek word archai, an old word that is used symbolically to denote ancient times. It is also used to depict individuals who hold the highest and loftiest position of rank and authority. By using the word archai, Paul emphatically tells us that at the very top of Satan's kingdom are powerful, evil beings that have held their lofty positions of power and authority since ancient times, probably ever since the fall of Lucifer. Paul goes on to tell us that below principalities, principalities, there's a second group of evil he refers to as powers. This word powers is taken from the Greek exousia and it denotes delegated authority. This describes a lower secondary level of evil beings 
demon spirits who have received delegated authority from Satan to carry out all manner of evil in whatever they desire, in whatever they desire to do. These evil forces are second in command in Satan's dark kingdom, continuing in the description of Satan's rank and file in the descending order paul mentions the rulers of the darkness of this world this amazing phrase is taken from the word cosmo crateros and is a compound of the words cosmos and kratos the word cosmos denotes order or arrangement whereas the word kratos has to do with raw power Thus, the compounded word cosmo, cosmo crateros depicts raw power that has been har harnessed and put into some kind of order. This word cosmo crateros was at times used to picture military training camps where young men were assembled, trained, and turned into a mighty army. These were young men were like raw power when they first arrived in the training camp. However, as the military training progressed and the new recruits were taught discipline and order, all that raw manpower was converted into an organized disciplined army. This is the word Paul now uses in his description of Satan's kingdom. So what does that mean? It tells you and me that Satan is so serious about doing damage to the human race that he deals with demon spirits as though they are troops. He puts them in rank and file, gives them orders and assignments and sends them out like military soldiers who are commanded to kill. Just as men in a human army are equipped and trained in, in their methods of destruction, so too are these demon spirits. And since these demons are trained and ready to start their assault, Satan sends them forth to do their devious work against human beings. Paul makes reference to this dispatch of evil spirits when he writes next about spiritual wickedness in high places. The work of the word wickedness is taken from the word paneros and is used to depict something that is bad, violent, malevolent, vicious, impious, and malignant. This tells us the ultimate aim of Satan's dark domain. These evil spirits are sent forth to afflict humanity and in, and in bad, vile, malevolent, and vicious ways. Those who are in the light can see that happening. Those in the darkness can't even tell what's coming at them. Satan's kingdom is manifested in the ungodly evil that keeps popping up in our culture. I shouldn't call it our culture. It's not our culture. Our culture wouldn't approve gay marriage. Our culture wouldn't murder unborn babies. Our culture wouldn't encourage children to question their gender. Our culture as Christian believers in a Christian church wouldn't be demonstrating to pull the rug out from under Israel. Our culture, that's not our culture. We're not in the kingdom and culture of Satan. We have emerged from that. We're in God's kingdom. We are in the kingdom of light. John 17, 14 and 15, I have given them your word and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That was Jesus' prayer for us. Satan's kingdom was born in rebellion. Satan was the most beautiful creature. 
He was the worship leader in heaven. The evil monster of jealousy entered him, and he thought that he should have worship for himself. He lost his place in heaven. He rebelled against God, and he was cast out. He took a third of the angels with him, and they are demons. God's kingdom on, on earth was created in light. He said, let there be light. He created the light first. That was the first thing he said, let there be light. Because everything else he created needed light to live. And we need the holy light of God's word for our spirits to live and to thrive. Darkness is the absence of light. The light is still there, but something interferes with it. Something obscures it. When the world turns away from the sun, the sun's still there. It didn't go away. The born-again believer is living in the light, spiritual light. John 8, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In Ephesians 6, 5, 8 to 20, it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are the light. In the Lord, live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why, in verse 14, it is said, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have been numbering these points, and this one is seven. Satan does everything he can to interfere with God's holy light. His whole existence is to oppose God. He bears a grudge against the one who cast him out. His whole existence is to get in between the light and those who need it. He wants to keep those who are darkness of sin right where they are. He also tries to get born-again believers to fall back into darkness, which can happen. I've experienced it myself. The attacks, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10, the coming of the lawless one, will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are, re who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. They re perish because they refused to be saved. Salvation comes through faith. Salvation doesn't make sense. You can't convince someone through logic that the Son of God will come to vile earth, live a perfect life, suffer and die, 
allow himself to be crucified to pay the penalty for our sins. That doesn't make any sense. It's not logical, but it's true. Thank God. Praise the Lord, it's true. But you can't convince somebody by logic or by reason that, that that's true because it doesn't make any sense. So how does that, how does that come? How does you get past reason and logic and get into the heart, into the soul? The Holy Spirit brings the conviction. The Holy Spirit does that. He pulls down that veil of obscurity and lets the light come in. That's how it happens. It takes the conviction of the Holy Spirit to overcome our thought processes and then light can come in. Satan uses doubt as a weapon. Doubt is a wedge. Did God really say, he said to Eve, he put a wedge, he put a doubt in her mind. Does the Bible really mean that, some might say? Would God really send someone to hell? Was Adam really the first man? Did God really part the Red Sea? People have, people have doubts, and that drives a wedge between a fa your faith and darkness. All Satan has to do is establish a doubt, destroy your faith, and then you are in his kingdom of darkness. We have to cling to our faith in Jesus. Cling to it. And him crucified. We have to cling to the truth of God's word. Let no doubt enter in. Satan uses fear against us. Fear is in direct opposition to faith. Fear can paralyze us. We can only begin to fight against fear when we know where it comes from. We are instructed in the Bible to fear the Lord. That's in reverence and respect, not in terror. Reverence and respect. We're not to fear the lies and deceptions of the enemy. Satan is a master of hiding his identity and masking his strategies. And therefore Jesus told his disciples, that's us, to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Second Timothy 1, 7, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Point number eight, God is going to take care of Satan. His days are numbered. God's gonna take care of him, he's done, and he knows it. Revelation chapter 20, seven to 10, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle in number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. God's gonna take care of that. No more, no more. Point number nine, meanwhile, guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23, above, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Your heart is where your thought process begins. Actions begin as thoughts. You don't, you don't just, you think, I'm gonna go to the store today. You just don't go, you think, you, you, you have a thought and then you do it. All action begins as a thought. And your, thought, and your heart is where your thought processes begin. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The thoughts 
That's where your heart, your heart is where your thoughts come from. He's talking there about the days of Noah. Thoughts come from the heart. Satan's kingdom always tries to influence the thought processes of your heart. Satan is not omnipresent. He doesn't have the attributes of God. He can only be in one place at a time. And he doesn't have time for you personally. But he has millions of agents in the form of demons that are assigned to keep people in the dark kingdom. I think he has agency assigns to keep churches down. And you see what's happening in churches? Rainbow stuff, alphabet stuff in the churches. Where did all that stuff come from? It came from somebody's thought processes, which is in their heart. It comes from demons. I'm convinced Baal was a demon. Chemosh and Molech. Because they all were worshipped the same way by murdering babies. Burning them alive. I think it was the same demon in, th in three different faces. And it was just a statue. Cow-headed human with a cow head with horns. If you've ever seen depictions of that, there are depictions of it. We have to guard our hearts. Next one is stay in the word. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirits, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Do you think your attitudes might need to be judged? Well, they do. Unless I'm the only person in here that has thoughts that need to be judged. I feast on the word every day. It's not enough to go to church and hear the preacher bring a message. It's not enough. You need your own personal daily dose of God's word. It's nourishment for your soul. You need to have a plan. There are online reading plans that can get you through the Bible in a whole year. I like the one-year Bible. Uh, I'm on my 28th year going through the one-year Bible. You have a, you have a date. Every, every, there's a date. And on that date, there's an Old Testament, a New Testament, a Psalm, and a Proverb. Goes through all four of those consecutively. 20 minutes a day, and at the end of the year, you read the whole Bible. And so that's what I do. I'm on a 28th time. I wore two of them out. They fell apart. I'm being a little more careful with this one. It's getting a little, a little bit, you know, but I used to keep my pen in the Bible in there so I could make notes, but it, that was damaging because it was breaking the binding. <laughs> it took me two or three of those Bibles to learn that. Now I just keep a little bookmark in there. Next thing is you got to have a prayer life. Set, a set, a, set aside a time every day for prayer. It's your connection to God. Communicating with God is a two-way communication to Him. He wants to hear that you love and appreciate Him. He wants to know what your concerns are. But we need to listen. We need to learn to listen. God speaks with a still, small voice. It's just an impression that comes into your mind. I should say into your heart. It's just an impression. Sometimes he impresses you with something he wants you to do. You need to check it out in the Word because the Spirit always goes the way of the Word and God speaks to you through his Word and God speaks to you. But in your prayer life, you need to leave time we, we rattle off a list of things God wants to, that we want God to do, and then we get up and say, okay, God, I'll see you later. Don't give him a chance to tell us what he wants us to do. 
That's one-sided prayer. But we should be like the boy Samuel in the Bible, where he said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And then God spoke to him. Sometimes God has something to say to you. Sometimes he doesn't, but we need to listen. Amen? It would be rude for you to speak to somebody and just go away and not let them respond. That's what we do. <laughs> That's what we do. The dark kingdom, John 15, 18 and 25. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written by their law. They hated without reason. The kingdom of light. Colossians 1, 12 to 14. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, that's when we emerge from the dark kingdom into the light kingdom. There are two kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness, Satan's realm. The kingdom of God, into which holy light of the gospel brings sinners when they repent and embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I'm closing with this, John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The world we see around us is full of trouble. It comes right up to your door. It comes in the mail. It comes in our schools now. I'm not gonna keep on about that, but that's the world and that's the trouble of it. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome all the evil things that we see around us. He has already defeated that. And he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He did that for us so we can go and live with him in eternity. Amen. What an awesome, awesome thought. We just have to put up with this for a little while. Amen. Would you stand? I'm done talking now. We don't have to worry about who's already at the restaurant because we're going to eat right here. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for, oh Lord, just who you are, that you penetrate darkness, that we are brought into the light. And we pray, Lord, that you will use us to bring other people into the light and out of the darkness in partnership with your Holy Spirit who brings, who pulls down that veil of obscurity we thank you, Lord, just for who you are and for everything you do for us, Lord. And as we go now to the Family Life Center, we pray that you'll bless the morsels we're about to receive to the health and nourishment of our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I have to, I have to cook the hot dogs.